welcome. I'm Josh Perkins, a Head's VP of Emerging Technologies, and I'm joined here today by Alan Klingerman. Hey, thanks for the time today, Josh. It's exciting. And Alan Klingerman, I'm Chief Technology Strategist for Power Edge and AI at Dell Technologies. We thought we would spend some time today kind of just talking through what we're seeing across AI in the industry right now. And we're doing this uh, from our uh, Financial Services Summit. So we figured it'd be kind of really appropriate to spend some time talking about what we're observing in that space and how our financial services clients are really starting to take advantage of the differentiated offerings in, in the space that we have. So Alan, you guys are at the vanguard of trying to help organizations, especially on the enterprise side, really start to build the platforms to take advantage of their AI aspirations and start developing more efficiency and consistency around what they're doing at scale. So I think just right off the rip, on the, on the basis of all the announcements that we've seen around AI Factory, can you help us understand a little bit more about like what that actually means, what it is, and maybe how you guys see it as being a major enabler for organizations like banking and capital markets? No, that's great. Um, and yeah, everything is all about the Dell AI factory at this point. Hopefully uh, our viewers had a chance to hear a little bit about it at both uh, NVIDIA GTC as well as Dell Technologies World, which was codenamed the AI edition, by the way, because uh, that's it. all we talked about there. Um, and you know, we think about it as almost like the flywheel of innovation for a business, right? Like how am I gonna actually achieve outcomes for AI? There's a lot of AI for AI's sake. We had that conversation sure. this morning, like uh, lots of incredible things uh, you were showing that's happening in the space and, and in the category. But at the end of the day, we wanna quickly, you know, through a factory approach, and we'll talk a little bit and break that down, like how do we quickly get them to inference so that an organization can actually get value out of AI? I think everybody's struggling with that. Like everybody talks about AI, but I'm not gonna you know, actually receive value as a company unless it's powered by my data and I get it at inference, right? To actually achieve a result. It's a, it's a really good point. I think so many of the organizations we work with are used to an ROI that starts at the like actual implementation of the equipment. And in this space, it's there's so much time experimentation and, and frankly designed failure to a large degree that all comes prior to any real business value creation. And I and I think like broadly speaking, that's been one of the big things around the difference between kind of technology firms getting huge value out of their AI investments and ultimately enterprises seeing that value at scale. And so that I think your point on inference is just so spot on and um, arguably, we would expect that inference is going to be a way more applicable use case and workload um, for the wide variety of organizations participating way more frequently than even large-scale training operations are going to be. Is that is what you guys are seeing as well? Oh, I, I, I can't agree with you more. Uh, and, and you talked about that. And if you saw our one slide, uh, that, that we talk about that all the time, right? It's like, what do we really see in all four phases of the AI lifecycle that people are going to make the investment? there's gonna be very few that make the big massive investment in actually building their own model. Uh, we see it really in the middle, right, of fine tuning and prompt engineering with the customer's data to actually be able to achieve some outcome for the business. Um, you know, because even there's some great things that happens from a, we talked about this morning, from a productivity perspective, right, sure. with Copilot and other services like that, but the value is lower. Where's the value really going to come in when I can actually bring the organization's you know, data to my AI? By the way, it's in our tagline, bring AI to your data. Sure. Right? It's about taking GPU-enabled compute and bringing it next to where the data lives, which you know, according to Gartner is still 83% of data lives on-prem. So if I'm going to bring that GPU-enabled compute there, especially in a highly regulated environment right. like banking to finance, that's super key, right? Of how do I make sure that I do that, bring it down, and actually achieve a result by giving it to inference? I think that's a really kind of astute observation too is that so much of our, our banking and cap markets customers are focused on trying to drive out real value from really, really controlled data sets. And I think it's it's not a matter of the trusting the cloud as much as it is trying to make sure that you can work on the most high value targets and, and not wanting to have to constantly move information to, to make that happen. And so, so much of the investment that we've seen isn't predicated on like, well, we, we, we think it's wildly more effective or efficient to do something. It's really like, we just want to be able to get to where things are faster and more frequently. And so it, certainly I think the really, really regulated environments, this makes a tremendous amount of sense why we're seeing so much build in anticipation and work in that space. And I know we're here today for financial services, but, but I mean, I think we're seeing incredibly similar things within our healthcare provider ecosystem, within our pharma ecosystem and ultimately uh, in our energy and utilities groups because of 
the way that they deal with extremely uh, IP sensitive information as a core component of their business. Yep. And so outside of those like deeply generalized use cases, outside of you know basic rag architecture approaches and co-pilot tools and any other kind of facsimile thereof, as soon as you get into expert models that require specific and deep domain data, those are regulated data sets. And so to me, this AI factory, this kind of how do we make this easy ramp, so to speak, for organizations to focus less on the underpinnings and more on the outcome that they're yes. looking for is a massive value for most organizations because the skill sets required not just to build those platforms, but frankly, need to be spent more on how to help them operationalize those efforts because day one is not something they're going to repeat over and over again with any level of frequency, but actually getting the permeation of that platform into their environment is going to be really critical for success. And if, if they're going to actually you know, have something that's going to be their flywheel of innovation, they have to be able to do that faster, faster. right? How yep. do I quickly get it to, really we think about it in the four aspects, right, that organizations are looking to leverage AI for. Uh, we see it one of driving growth, right? It's revenue or profit to organization. That's why sure. we heard it today. Sales and marketing is the biggest use case. By the way, it's not just financial services. I see that one broadly, everywhere. Broadly, broadly across yep. almost every industry or vertical. For sure. Um, and then we think about tied to that and driving growth. It could also be driving on operational expense through looking for, uh, a, you know, for anomaly detection in a manufacturing plant, for example, or anomaly detection, like I shared with you, some of the computer vision use cases we even have of like going down to an ATM and look for fraud that might be happening or measure a customer's sentiment when they walk into uh, you know, a branch location. Yeah. Like those are huge things of how do I achieve that to, to drive growth. And then we think about it uh, of it enhancing experiences because everybody, <laughs> right, uh, loves an experience. Sure. They, they want a different opportunity to come in and experience what your good or service is because I'm going to spend more if I like you and I have a good experience. Uh, so how do I en enhance that experience and touch points we heard that kind of as a common theme yeah. this morning too, of touch points back to the customer to make them want to purchase more goods or service and keep you engaged and interactive uh, with what they do as an organization, right? Yeah, I think that the concept of hyper-personalization, <laughs> you know, which we hear about, every time we're in a retail discussion, we hear about omni-channel becoming hyper-personalization and meeting the customer where they are. But, uh, and frankly, like retail banking is very much the same way, right? We want to. Yep be able to meet customers and offer very unique goods and services to meet them where they are in that specific financial journey. And and banks can't just naturally accomplish that based on the constituencies they're working with, right? They, they're they gonna need these tools to be really dependable, consistent and proficient, um, and also really compliant, right? In order to be able to do yep. those things. So to, to me, the, the, the thought process in financial services right now is, you know, how can we get them experimenting and how can we grow that ideation funnel to the largest extent possible, not expecting all of those things to be you know, the next big thing in banking, but to broadly redefine to a large degree what is possible through that whole ecosystem. And so when you hear you know, stuff that our customers were talking about today, it gives me a, a tremendous amount of uh, excitement over the fact that we're just nipping at the edges of you know, improving processes and improving pieces as opposed to com the complete redefinition of what's going on in the space. And we're still probably a little ways away from that, potentially yeah. in most of these organizations. But we're making strides But we're forward. making major progress. Yeah. And, and the way that we want to kind of level the playing field and not be in a situation where everyone is constantly defining all of their own pieces parts, right? That standardization mm -hmm. approach, the how do we automate access to these pieces um, really should allow more and more people across these organizations to spend time in the right ways, which is helping us figure out what needs to be changed and novel approaches to changing it. Um, and I, I would call out too, I love what you said there because when I think of the AI factory, like the two areas, like the input is the data, Sure. And we're doing some very unique things there, right, to help there, because a lot of customers really struggle with traditional uh, processes, ETL, et cetera, of like, what does that look like? Or never made the big investments to look at, at a data lake, right, for structured and unstructured data sets to sure. pull all this together, because we know we have a data problem to achieve these results. Um, so, you know, having an engine out there, like the Dell Data Analytics engine, to be able to, you know, do a high-speed query in place and not have to go through all that is a huge boon to the organization sure. at that early stage. And then you kind of covered, like, the we were talking about the use cases. That's the outcome of the factory, right? Sure. So, I got data coming in, I got outcomes going out, and by the way, the data lives where? 
everywhere, right? All the way out to the edge. We talked about some great edge use case scenarios, right? That we're just kind of rolling through in the branch. And then what you said there is what we do in the middle, right? Is that's the repeatable, uh, you know, fashion from an infrastructure perspective uh, so that they can have a tested, proven and validated architecture to quickly move forward with, right? Yep. So that's that's our flywheel of innovation is the factories there in the middle, need your data, now I build this factory and I'm gonna get you to your use cases very quickly. Sure. Yeah, I think we, we see it very much as this idea, like I, maybe it's just the way that we had kind of a head think about this broadly, but we're always trying to think about it from the perspective of like an operating model for AI, right? So what 100%. are all of the pillars that an organization needs to be thinking about and maturing, frankly, in a parallel fashion to make sure that they can learn and use those learnings in a very closed feedback scenario to get better and better and faster from idea to business, that business value, that outcome, that use and consumption. And to us, like certainly the platform piece plays a pretty key role in its ability to scale efficiently and that we're using the right tools and we're creating access. But even beyond that, there's all of the, the data engineering pieces and data science components that go into it and how do we get the skills around that that are required? Um, how do we make good, consistent decisions? How do we apply a governance model that makes sense in an AI-driven, use case-driven world, yep. right? Um, and, and how do we prioritize and know what to work on, branch out into the organization? So I think like from a, from a banking or an investment management group, there's just so many opportunities, right? Like the hundreds and hundreds of use cases where we think about advanced workflows that could be altered or changed or optimized or just the amount of data that people can't naturally work against and perceive to make those good decisions. But to get there, to like to really get there is gonna require collective efforts from teams like the both of ours, in my opinion, to really say like, how do we fundamentally make sure that we're making strides across all, all 10 of those kind of different domains and each organization will have to figure out what order of operations they need to do that in, right? Where they yes. are in that journey, how they are in their own maturity, and the honesty that they need to have with themselves through that process um, will help kind of allow us to accelerate that and meet them where they are in that in, in process overall. And, and I liked what you said there because a big piece of the AI factory, outside of what we talked about of the data and the use cases out and the infrastructure in between, it's gonna take a team sport. I keep saying it's sure. like AI is gonna be the biggest team sport in history. And as part, we need partnerships. This is why we love working with Ahead because you bring a great amount of valued skill set, right, to help customers achieve this. We're never gonna be able to uh, you know, help customers achieve this on our own. We provide the infrastructure, the core validated architectures, right, that's prescribed, sure. as well as uh, working with open ecosystem partners, right, certainly Meta, Hugging Face, and many others that our, our listeners are probably used to, but um, you know, we need services partners to help our customers that journey, because frankly, there's just not enough skill set to go around. We talked about that in this morning's yep. session, too. I think the other thing that we've seen a lot of is that it's easier it's easier in so many ways to innovate in the startup ecosystem than it is in the large enterprise sector. <laughs> but so many of our banking clients are are built on decades, if not hundreds of years, right? Yeah. Uh, of of not only innovation and standards, but also the technical debt drag that comes through that process. And this kind of blending that we're seeing from the fintech ecosystem and the traditional banking and IB space, um, certainly creates a whole new world of opportunity too and new needs on teams and co-development and yep. frankly just a, a different way of operating kind of moving into the into the new space. So how do you see, I know you guys have a pretty wide ISV ecosystem that you work with and we have OEM efforts that we've aligned to in support yep. of those particular pieces. How do you see the fintech startup space and the, their focus on expert models and specific kind of domain functions how do you see that playing into like the future, the bank of the future kind of ecosystem? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, because I, I think about the historical places where a lot of them came from that we've been doing for a very long time, right? Sure. Uh, I was chasing HPC and, and other things with Monte Carlo simulations and yeah. uh, traditional HFT environments, right? That really kind of gave birth to a lot of this. So now it's like, how do I you know, take it to the next level? Sure. Uh, I, I think it really has the opportunity to upend that category altogether. Uh, we're making some pretty big investments there, you know, from a Dell IP perspective too, to help them. 
Uh, what I would say is, you know, outside of just the framework of what we described for, you know, the AI factory, I love what you said there. We do a lot of work. In fact, if you broke like our PowerEdge family, right, our server family apart, uh, we're number one and number two server provider in the world because of OEM. Sure. And there's a lot of that bespoke work that we're doing in the OEM category with partners like yourself yep. to do that. And then we're actually like curating, this is a good way to think about it. Uh, we think that software innovation, especially in a lot of these spaces, can be with a software ISV, right? It, Absolutely. You kind of called this out. Yep. So what can we do to catalog all of those software ISVs and then bake them into an appliance? So now we have like the easy button for AI. De risking instead of, it to we, a large degree. 100%, it's build versus buy, right? Yep. Like I want to move it more from, we're definitely 100% of what we say all this morning. We're in a build phase of AI. We want to get to more of a consumption or buy phase to actually achieve those results. And I, I think that's a, an area that's going to happen there in fintech as well. Yeah. I mean, we've even seen some of the larger um, traditional firms acquire fintechs now yep. on the basis <laughs> of want, not only wanting the IP, but wanting the infusion of the kind of the, the, the feeling, the motives, the way that they operate, yeah. what they can rejuvenate around development teams. Um, there's countless examples of that happening in the last two years, and AI seems to be generating a whole new batch of potential acquisitional targets in these particular spaces. 100%, and I think it's just going to, back to the flywheel of innovation, sure. it's a great example even at the industry level. Yeah. What would you tell, I mean, I guess, you know, the beauty of working with Dell is that you guys get to see so much, right? So many different environments, people solving so many different challenges and you guys essentially synthesizing and what we like to call it crowdsourcing innovation, right, from our clients. <laughs> yep. Um, so what can we learn, what can we distill, what can we share? Like, what, what's the one or two things you would tell a CIO or a CTO just kind of trying to establish AI as a program in practice today? Like, what, what, should, what do they start? Where should they start? The, I, I, I'm gonna go back to where we started our conversation. In fact, even what happened in the session this morning, I loved it. Uh, you know, with kind of the the count, the uh, rollout of how customers are approaching this, right, internally, of thinking about it from the use case perspective, because we have a very similar approach in our yeah. services practice, right, of like actually categorizing those, determine those that are going to have the fastest time to value and a high ROI for the business and get it to a fit score, right? For Is sure. it bigger, better, faster for the business? If it's not, it's probably off the table, not something I'm going to pursue. We had to do this. We yep. had over a thousand, right? Our, our, we, we named uh, Jeff Boudreau as our chief AI officer six months ago, and we had about 1,500 use cases across the company. And the first thing Jeff said was, whoa, I've got to get control of this. We need to not and do some things. Yeah. <laughs> I have to prioritize and figure out right. what has a high enough value and what's the right fit. So if it, is it bigger, better, faster for the company? And then it goes back to some of the things we just talked about. Do I have the right data sets? Do I have the right talent? Do I have uh, you know, the right process that I can actually change? Because this is what also we're talking about is, is process change management, For right? Sure. That goes hand in hand with AI that I think a lot of people, like everybody gets excited about the excitement uh, about AI, but nobody's thinking about what's it going to mean organizationally when I deploy that. For sure. How am I going to change the process and people to actually implement what you even said earlier of what is AI in many cases today? It's not AI or Gen AI. A lot of times it's automation. automation. Yeah, it's it's funny. I think that the change management piece is so is so critical because if business value creation occurs at consumption, then how we get scale of consumption is through navigating change, right? <laughs> and so it, yep. they're like deeply, deeply intertwined in terms of how do we get more people on the boat? How do we have improvements in AI literacy? I think that's another really key key function and focus across customers that we're talking with right now, if we if we look at that and said like, you know, what are you doing to start? It's, you know, do you understand AI governance to a level of understanding responsible use? Do you know what fairness and bias and all of these other implications are in your organization? Yep. Um, and are you prepared to, to put a filtration process in place to, to deal with that, to enable other people to, to bring those ideas and, and make use of it? And then ultimately, how good can you get at widening the, the scope of people's understanding because the more people that have a good basis for what AI means and has have expertise and proximity to things within your organization that could be altered by it, yep. the better the ideas get into the funnel, the, the more clarity that there is, and frankly, just the ingenuity spikes that occur 
from that level of like up leveling in education is is amazing. And ultimately, the more educated people are, the more willing they are to then make those downstream changes when we're able to start functionally deploying those use cases in those environments. Yep. So it just seems like this wonderful like snake eating its tail type scenario <laughs> going on. It's in all most intertwined. Yeah. 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 But it's easier said than done, right? So. Um, I think the, the key there is, you know. When you're dealing with people in process, it's always the hardest thing. Right? For sure, <laughs> for sure. And, and ultimately, I, I think the other thing that we've seen a lot of in this space is traditionally when, you know, we looked at large infrastructure projects and tech projects, it was very clear from the very beginning, like what the intentions were and what the impacts were to those scenarios. And now that's just fundamentally not the way that you know, we're we're looking at it and thinking about it in organizations. So I'm not doing a shootout for AI. Yeah, and I might yep. do that for my ERP system. Yeah, back to your traditional application, sure. but I'm not doing that for AI. Well, <laughs> and we don't even necessarily know what everything that we're going to use those platforms for, or the ingenuity that kind of brings. Even to, if we started today, yeah, we bring right. the factory in, we put it in place. I, yeah, I don't have all those use cases defined, defined. and some that I, I'm probably going to learn, right? If it's my flywheel innovation, uh, hopefully going to continue to keep that factory running hot, right? Absolutely. And have more and more use cases that are high ROI to the business. Yeah, I think it makes it makes perfect sense. It's not a field of dream scenario. It's not <laughs> build it in the hopes of value. It's, it's right. have clearly defined metrics that drive needs for the factory to get started. But I think one of the things we heard earlier today that I, that you know we definitely subscribed to that I thought was great to hear from from clients as well was not everything is going to be this self funding like massively impactful use case. So how do you balance that kind of portfolio and make sure that the things that are wildly impactful help you build the other things that maybe aren't as evident on the front end, but yep. have a material impact as they kind of continuously build it at scale. And then the other piece of it that's just so interesting, I think, through that whole space is just this idea that, you know, how do we get closer and closer to a point where the time between that idea and that consumption of it continues to compress shrink. based it on, has how, to shrink. on how how much learning we get out of those scenarios. Or, or, or even back to what we were talking about earlier of appliances and ISVs yep. can help us even shrink that further, right? Yep. To where I get to more of a spectrum of buy than, you know, build. Sure. Well, like one of the things that we hear a lot, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it, is, you know, not everybody has treated data with the utmost respect <laughs> over the last decade, right? We've done a lot of enterprises have done a lot of can kicking to a degree, just by how how messy, right, information is in most enterprises. And so, like, does an organization, in your mind, I know how I feel about it, but in your mind, you know have to have perfect data in order to get started on, down this road? I, I feel like our opinions changed over the last five or six years on this one and probably gone in both directions. I, I The way I, I think now, back to if we're trying to accelerate the innovation engine, right, for the for the organization, we ha we can't have perfect data. We can't worry about it because there's lots of technical debt sure. that led to this in the d data engineering side because nobody, that's exactly what you called out, No nobody did the hard work, right? right? Or or it went to a certain point and every, not everybody got to predictive analytics because yeah, they didn't build out a Hadoop Global governance cluster. was very, very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, they, so the, if they're not there, then it's like, how do we quit? Quickly, once we do that fit analysis to understand those ones that have good use cases, then we quickly want to identify, and I think you guys do something similar, like what's it, what data is in scope or out of scope. For sure. So then I'm only focused on that data set to solve that problem. And over time, we're going to chip away, right, as we go through each use yeah, case. Yeah, it's a culmination. We're, we're very much looking at the same way. We're saying, okay, if I look at the use case, what I really want to understand is what data and at what quality is necessary to prove out the value of that, right? And get it to a yep. point where it becomes usable. And I think uh, earlier we saw the kind of the nine the nine box scenario of like impact versus feasibility. And so, so much of the kind of pilot work we've done is to highlight where the idea is really good, the KPIs are potentially addressable, but we have certain gaps. But those gaps are much smaller in scope than everything within a giant data <laughs> governance program. <laughs> right. So if, if the impact is worthy of that effort, we can then go make sure that we address that data gap, but align to those particular use cases as opposed to just saying, we have a data quality issue at scale. Um, Which I, I think, I think it actually difference. causes some, per it, it, what you just said too, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, some customers get you know uh, kind of paralysis 
Oh, for because sure. they're scared. It's daunting, and they know they and they know they have the data architecture issue yep. that, and all this technical debt, and they don't know how to start. Yeah, and they're like, I can't do AI until I solve this, and it's it's to our point here. No, you don't have to solve the whole thing. Yeah, it's it, it's not reliant on perfection across the entire entire data environment. I think. That's been the big shift in my mind in the last 18 to 24 months is this recognition that we can do really, really cool things with, with good quality data, right? As opposed to everything being in amazing shape. And I think the other piece is that the, the tech industry at a larger scale, the, the big, big hyperscale kind of AI ecosystems are, are really living in a world where they have the ability to throw tremendous amounts of compute at extremely high volume of relatively low quality data, right? And get good outcomes. Yes. But most enterprises have lower volume of extreme high quality data, and we can still get amazing outcomes from those particular situations. Yep. And I think that inflection point to me is really the key difference of how do we get out of just the hyperscalers get really value out of AI into how can we build expertise and functional, um, real, real impact, frankly, at an enterprise level. Maybe I'll give you, as we start to wrap down, maybe one thing I'll, I'll give you an example of that is, you know, we're, we, one of the areas we started at internally uh, was training. A lot yeah. of people don't even think about this. Yeah. Like training and education for our new hires coming in. Absolutely. Like think about it at Dell, what are we going to do? Have a little conversation about our competition, right? And how are they going to be able to address, you know, any conversations they might have with the customer, you know, about a competitive platform? And how do I train the, yeah. the new employee coming in? Uh, to that point, wouldn't it be great as we had modules of data like we're used to going through in, in education? Well, instead of having modules, what if I had it as a digital human that I interacted with and she role played with me sure. and understood what that looked like? Oh, and by the way, to your point, I only trained her on each of the modules data. So we had high quality data and training that we were providing, narrowing but doing scope. it, but but narrowing the scope and and by the way, here's the, the side effect as you can imagine, we, we you know we have a great farm system, right? We hire uh, all over around Texas from all the universities. Sure. All, all the newer generation uh, you know kids coming out of college, they were super excited. They're like this is a bright, innovative technology company, and look at what they did. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Uh, so you'll hear more about her. I know you've seen her, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and she's been out there on some of the the, the YouTubes and LinkedIn, but uh, Clara is one of our first digital humans we introduced to the market, and she'll be coming in other aspects that we're doing. And then we introduced a new one at Dell Technologies World called Andy uh, as kind of an Ask the Expert. So oh, I'll nice. give you another example of that, of like that's even using RAG, and where we did some fine tuning to where literally he could go in and actually understood the PowerFlex platform. So we had a number of these kiosks uh, that they could uh, anybody could go up and interact with at Dell Technologies World and ask a question in a platform. But we couldn't use you know traditional retrieval augmented generation. We wanted to give more context, right? Of course. Uh, so we had to do some prompt engineering and fine tuning against it so that it had a better result. When right. somebody asked it, it understood PowerFlex. Yeah. 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 The I think the the knowledge use case piece in general seems like such a powerful tool, right? Not only from, to your point, enablement, but I think of even just the reduction of tribal knowledge, the, the <laughs> kind of flattening of the way an organization is able to attack problems with junior level associates on senior level challenges. Yep. And, and how do we get closer to that point? And to, to the large degree, I think even things like being able to interface with a you know natural natural language interface in general especially for enablement yep. addresses huge gaps in the way people experientially learn and the deltas between how people operate in those spaces and what they get out of that enablement so that i mean very very cool use case and one that i think we see pretty much every enterprise needing to kind of think through and address and will have a material impact on. And, and by the way, that's one of those appliances that I was referring to. Yeah. We're partnered with a couple of software ISVs and have it preloaded and ready to go, right? There's still some work to be had, but uh, I, I don't even necessarily need a traditional data scientist to do some of that fine tuning and prompt engineering. Sure. The engine can do that. So it was actually like our product team that knew the products that had the domain expertise that trained the model to be able sure. to address that and provide context. So it was incredible this use case, right? Without anybody kind of data science in the background. Right. Well, I mean, I, this whole thing just reminds me that while there's so much hype going on, that the underpinning of excitement is real. 
it's warranted. It's it's a massive shift in, yeah. in the efforts that we have. And the first time, I think in a long time, where it's extremely clear how the technology ecosystem and the technology teams and groups within organizations are now closer aligned to real business value creation than they've ever been before. And so I think, you know, we had ahead and, and partnered with Dell. I mean, we could not be more excited about what the next few years will look like. And I can't wait to have the next version of this conversation in six or 12 months when we're talking and excited about whole new things going on in the space. Yeah, maybe the last thing I'll leave, leave the, the audience here with an uh, exciting investment that we made with Ahead, right? Yeah. Where you're gonna have your own AI factory uh, to be able to show and work right. on projects with, with your customers uh, and our mutual customers. So super excited of getting that live and in production and uh, ready to go with, with the Ahead uh, Dell AI factory. We are, we are very excited to have access to that ecosystem and I know our teams are chomping at the bit to be able to crack away at their own internal use case development as well within our ecosystem and help customers see how what we're learning through that process uh, and, and leveraging those tools. So we appreciate the investment in us and um, you know, just uh, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we look forward to having more conversations in the future. Thank you all.